Tihe Moriora, Tenakoto Katoa, Konnichiwa. Welcome, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to this uh, creatively named, poetically named, Cultivating Fertile Futures in Japan uh, webinar. My name is Brendan O'Connell, and I'm the Chief Executive of AgriTech New Zealand. And in partnership with NZTE, uh, delighted to welcome you to today's webinar. We've got uh, some great sessions lined up, and it'll be a a packed hour of uh, discussions about opportunities in Japan with some um, great speakers and knowledge holders. To give you an overview um, of the sessions, we will start out with some uh, research presentation about the Japanese market uh, and opportunities for Agritech New Zealand uh, that was commissioned by um, uh, NZTE in partnership with Deloitte, so we'll kick into that one shortly. Following that, we will have um, presentations from three panelists. Uh, and so today we have Mr. Jim Iota from um, the Yamaha Motor Ventures. Uh, we will have Mr. Makoto Kinjo, who was formerly the director of Ansgo Foods with 20 years experience representing New Zealand business in Japan. Uh, and Mr. Taka Takuya Sato, who's from the Japanese Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. Um, we'll be ending the day, by the way, with an opportunity to take part in a virtual business trip. So stay tuned uh, for the end to hear more about those details. Um, for today, we will be using the Q&A and the chat function. So during the, uh, during the presentations, if you have to chat with other attendees, please feel free to use the chat function, which will be down in the uh, middle of your screen. But to, answer, to ask questions, Please make sure you use the Q&A and we'll look at uh, definitely answering as many of those as we can uh, towards the end of the presentations and we'll feed them in as appropriate during, uh, during the presentation as well. So thank you for joining, looking forward to some great sessions. Uh, and so to start things out, I'd like to introduce the man who has helped put a lot of this session to together today. So Mr. Yoshifumi Imamura is the business development manager for NZTE based in Japan and has been doing some great work with Deloitte and as well as putting these presentations together for us. So Yoshifumi, please uh, tell us more about the research presentation and the work you've been doing with Deloitte. Thank you. And Kiara and Konnichiwa everyone. Uh, thank you, Brendan, and your team for the support to hold this webinar today. This is an exciting sector for us to be engaging with and developing opportunity together. Uh, with the tech sector in Japan, we had single idea our idea was that agricultural technology that underpins New Zealand's world famous food and beverage products should also be recognized here in Japan. One fact is that today, 95% of New Zealand agricultural technology is exported to countries outside of Asia. Japan is the third largest economy in the world, and we want to access more opportunities for New Zealand agricultural technology in Japan. Last year uh, with Zero Japan, uh, we worked together for six months researching the agri-tech market in Japan. And we had uh, uh, produced an in-depth report that shows a lot uh, of the areas we can focus on grow business opportunity in the sector. I would now like to introduce uh, Fayez Buruani, manager of business development strategy group and Mr. Nagai uh, Kiyohiko, a uh, senior manager at Deloitte Tosh Thomas in Tokyo. Fayez and Nagai-san are based in Tokyo and were key members to leading our agri-tech sector research in Japan. Uh, Fayez and Nagai-san are passionate about key uh, industries in Japan related to agriculture, financial services and retail, and have particular focus on technological innovation to inform where to play and how to win choices. Uh, Fayez and Nagai-san are actively engaged in formulating market entry strategies with us to expand our agri-tech presence in Japan and now South Korea as well. Uh, Fayez and Nagai-san, thank you for your time again today. And we are looking forward to hearing some of the insights from the research. Thank you, Fayez. Thank you for the introduction, Imamura-san. And thank you everybody for taking your time today to join. Uh, I do hope today's brief introduction of the market sparks some interest to further explore the opportunities Japan has to offer. 
I'll uh, provide some context by uh, first kicking off and highlighting some of the key trends that are shaping um, the Japanese agriculture sector. And this is what's really driving that imperative for ag tech adoption. When we look at the supply and demand fundamentals, for example, um, domestic agriculture production has been significant decline in Japan since its peak levels in the 1980s. There's also been a large shift in terms of uh, the production categories, which is primarily attributed to that change in culinary preference from rice-based diets to wheat, um, as well as a stronger demand for uh, key categories such as vegetables, fruits, livestock, and dairy, um, which have exhibited some of the strongest growth uh, in the most recent years. Um, what's really important to note is that the food self-sufficiency rate in Japan is quite low at 38%, some of the lowest recorded in history, which essentially means that more than 60% of the calories consumed in Japan come from imports. And this really speaks to the challenges that local farmers have in terms of sustaining domestic demand. But it's not only domestic demand um, that's been a challenge for these uh, local domestic farmers. Um, it's also meeting that global demand for Japanese food. Um, there's been a significant rise in Japanese cuisine over the years, where I'm sure there's uh, no food enthusiast who hasn't heard about Japanese Wagyu. Uh, that demand um, significantly continues to rise year over year, where the Japanese government has also um, wanted to capitalize on that opportunity, where they've created a lot of initiatives to uh, double production in high value segments, such as Wagyu, also dedicating specific regions um, of Japan to focus on farming um, and ranching these type of products for export purposes only. They've also provided a range of funds, for example, um, to um, help provide capital for these ag tech investments um, enable to scale operations um, and drive productivity as well as meet some of these KPIs that the government has set. There are some major challenges that still remain in the Japanese market. Um, one of the biggest have to do with the demographics uh, in the nation. And that's a labor shortage issue where the domestic population is in significant decline. Um, and there's also a rapidly aging society. Uh, this effect is even more pronounced in the agriculture sector where most of the farmers are over the age of 60 as well. And the working population in the agri sector also continues to decline significantly. Um, in the last decade, it dropped by almost 45% itself. The farming operations are also much smaller in Japan. Um, there are smaller scale operations that are more centered on traditional farming practices. Um, for example, most of the land um, that is farmed in Japan, about 80% of the farmers work is only up to two hectares in size. So when you compare that to our peers in New Zealand, for example, um, it's much smaller where New Zealand's average are about 300 hectares and it's not unusual for farming operations to be in the thousands as well as tens and thousands of hectares. Um, there's also a significant challenge in terms of the arable land that's available uh, in the Japanese market. Most, at least two thirds of the land in Japan is covered by very mountainous and hilly terrain. Um, which really creates a good opportunity for ag tech adoption. Um, it will be important to leverage that limited land and that finite resources um, and utilize agri-tech solutions to maximize yield um, in that context. Vicky, I'll ask you to go to the next slide, please. When we look at the ag tech market, we've estimated it to be about 2.6 billion New Zealand dollars um, across all the key segments where the vegetables and uh, livestock segments um, have so much the uh, some of the largest potential opportunities in market size. Um, and this is also aligned with their domestic production outputs that have been significantly increasing in these areas uh, year over year. Uh, there's a range of key applications uh, where ag tech can really provide um, and provide those uh, competitive advantages and address some of the challenges in the market. And some, some of those include workforce shortage solutions. Um, that will be a critical area uh, for ActTech solutions, just given the demographics and the labor challenges. Um, solutions that can um, mechanize uh, labor intensive tasks, leveraging robotics and automation, for example. Uh, most of these solutions right now are dominated by European players. Uh, for example, GEA, Lely, and De Laval who work in the livestock sector um, and in dairying, for example, 
to provide uh, things like milking systems um, as well as feeding systems to uh, decrease that labor cost. There's also a lot of solutions uh, for workforce shortage um, that are being introduced in the horticulture industries, uh, especially in vegetables and fruits, where fruits is still um, heavily manually intensive um, in the Japanese sector. Um, things like pollination, harvesting, trimming, cutting, pruning, um, and knowing when vegetables are ripe for harvest um, using robots that are enabled with AI algorithms and computer vision to understand these kind of key uh, factors will be very important. And we're seeing more and more uh, ag tech companies provide such type of solutions. Biotech will also be an important area to play, um, especially in livestock and providing um, um, expertise in terms of strain and breed development uh, to create livestock products that are higher in yield, for example, in dairy, um, as well as higher in uh, protein content. But it'll be also important to uh, bring, uh, breed specific uh, strains that are also gentle on the environment. Um, as it relates to methane, as well as um, uh, nitrous, nitrous oxide leaching into waterways. Precision farming uh, will be a key game changer in the Japanese market. One of the reasons is that uh, most of the operations in Japan are extremely low in productivity uh, and high in costs. For example, um, in 100 hectare pieces of land, about 41 uh, tractors are used in Japan, whereas in uh, leading global peers, it's about um, one tractor per 100 hectares. So there's a significant imperative in um, capturing that accurate data, real-time data uh, based on GPS mediums and uh, providing those um, insights to optimize inputs as well as yields um, and really solving that finite um, resources uh, problem. We're seeing a lot of players here from overseas as well. Um, some of these examples are DGI, for example. They're providing, uh, they've partnered with Syngenta Japan and they're also providing UAV applications to optimize fertilizer uh, to optimize fertilizer usage. Uh, another such um, example is Trimble as well, who have partnered with Nikon uh, to provide surveying for agriculture services as well. A uh, really um, important um, key success factor for some of these precision farming solutions is ensuring that they're well paired with smart farming. Um, so they're all in one packages that have these um, competitive AI algorithms, uh, cloud computing for deriving the insights from the data that they, uh, that they do gather. Um, and they also leverage alternative farming techniques uh, such as vertical farming based on aquaponics and hydroponics as well. Some examples of this are also uh, Farmex from the US which um, partnered with Kubuta and the local market to bring their solution um, to the farmers here. Vicky, I'll ask you to go to the next slide please. When um, we look at some of the key pain points, it'll be very important for um, potential New Zealand agritech players to really consider these when formulating their business strategies um, and uh, looking at their go-to-market execution plans in the Japanese agriculture sector. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is the extremely high technology adoption costs that a lot of these um, ag tech solutions do pose for these small-scale farmers. Um, it's quite a big, uh, capital outlay for the hardware and software uh, needed to really adopt some of these um, ag tech solutions. So it'll be important to reconfigure cost matrices when coming into the Japanese market, providing innovative pricing strategies, such as subscription models um, and as a service models. One of, our, uh, one of, one of the one really great examples of this is uh, Inaho's robot as a service model, where they rent their automated vegetable harvester that uses AI. Um, for free, but they take a 15% yield um, of the grower um, in return for their services. It'll also be important to um, um, note that there's very low digital literacy among most of the farmers, uh, just given the age again, um, as well, um, this is aligned with integration complexity. So solutions will need to be um, very simplified um, in low complexity. They'll also need to be modular to enable that piecemeal um, application into existing farming practices. Integration complexity will also be important um, to ensure interoperability between different solutions. Right now in the market, there are a lot of ag tech providers um, that provide different solutions that work in silos. Uh, for example, IoT sensors that don't communicate um, with optimizing fertigation and drip irrigation systems. So that type of data latency will be important to minimize the onus on farmers um, in terms of learning to operate various different systems. 
there's also a significant lack of automation uh, in the market. So that'll be an easy win opportunity area, uh, companies that can really address that um, labor challenge uh, by providing robotics um, for harvesting, pollination, um, and very labor intensive tasks in the agriculture sector um, will really um, have some significant success in the market. It will also be important to provide semi-autonomous solutions for a lot of these farmers because they do wish to um, keep their differentiating agriculture practices um, in line with using the uh, new ag tech solutions. Overall, there is a big disconnect in terms of um, what the Japanese agri-tech market has right now um, uh, from the type of players and the solutions they're offering. Um, they don't really cater to the small needs of these Japanese farmers, um, as well foreign solutions in the market um, lack that localization in terms of their UI, their UX, and uh, most of their services are primarily designed for English native speakers and also um, uh, farm sizes of Western agriculture characteristics. And um, to end off, um, just a few points to consider when entering the market. It'll be, um, again, important to maximize yield uh, given the limited arable land. Um, ensure that solutions are able to uh, support these smaller scale growers, as well as um, ensure alignment with government directives and uh, look at providing ag tech solutions for those high value um, segments that exports, where, where most of the exports happen and where the government is focusing on, for example, Wagyu production. Um, as well as uh, dairying and livestock, which are growing segments in demand as well. And uh, one of the key success factors, I think, for a lot of uh, agri-tech solutions who do come into this market, uh, it'll be very important to engage some of the local stakeholders, uh, especially Japanese cooperatives, the JA, as they hold a significant influence in the Japanese agriculture sector. So um, it'll be really important to partner and collaborate um, with these type of with these type of with these type of entities when they come into the market, um, which will enable that uh, necessary localization support, and also provide a lot of uh, ag tech players that necessary access to the key distribution channels to roll out their services. So with that, I think I'm just coming up to my uh, 10 minute time. So let me hand it back to Brendan to see if um, he can facilitate any questions. Thank you, Fayez. That was a, a great presentation. Now, um, Kerry, I'm unable to turn on my video. You might do that for me. Not that people need to see me. I presume they can hear me. Um, uh, so great summary of both some of the challenges and many of the opportunities, Fayez. There are some questions coming through. Um, and so maybe we'll take a few minutes to cover these since there's such a, a peak of interest. Um, first of all, are, th are there any sort of um, um, supports for farmers to adopt technology in Japan? Yes, there are. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, government initiatives in terms of subsidies, uh, such as the A5 fund um, that provide that capital investment for agri-tech adoption. Uh, the government is also providing low interest loans uh, with flexible covenants um, to also make some of these investments. Um, and they're trying to pair educational facilities to improve that um, digital literacy and helping with adoption as well. Great, that, that would be a good one to, to follow up on as well. We can talk to the NZ team around that. And, and uh, the other questions coming through is, you know, um, you know, why aren't Japanese companies developing agri-tech solutions for their local market? I mean, is that happening? Um, or, or is part of the opportunity here to, um, to fill the gap there? I think that's exactly where the opportunity is, is addressing that gap. A lot of the firms um, in the local market are quite generalist um, conglomerates um, per se. For example, Panasonic and also companies that are uh, playing in different spaces um, like Rakuten or SoftBank, for example, they do lack that deep agri expertise. Um, and I think that's where the opportunity lies, especially for New Zealand ag tech firms um, in providing solutions that take into account that foundational knowledge um, and meet the local farmers' needs. Excellent. So it's it's both um, bringing in specific ag knowledge and addressing niches that maybe some of the larger uh, tech players in Japan aren't, aren't playing themselves. Very good. And uh, mm -hmm. are there any uh, are there any particular examples of successful agri tech solution New Zealand agri tech solutions deployed in, in Japan? Um, um, and, and a supplementary question: Are there foreign examples of agri tech applied in Japan? Um, I think right now there's, uh, there's very limited examples of New Zealand companies, but we are actively trying to get them into the market. 
Um, some examples of this is uh, heavily marketing firms like Robotics Plus, which we'll talk about later, which really address the needs um, um, in terms of the challenges a lot of these uh, farmers face, especially in fruits, which is uh, uh, filled with manually intensive tasks. And for other foreign providers, um, we're seeing a lot of companies from the US in vertical farming coming into the market, um, as well as farm management solutions such as PharmEx from San Francisco. Uh, but primarily livestock is dominated by European vendors, uh, such as uh, Lely and De Laval, oh. who are providing those uh, robotics very similar to what uh, New Zealand provides in terms of uh, companies like LIC Automation. But again, a lot of the solutions they are providing have lacked that um, adoption um, just due to the gap in localization um, of their services. After sales, for example, is primarily in English, um, which creates a big uh, challenge for a lot of these local farmers. Okay. Thank you for that. There, there are other questions coming through, but I'd like to make sure that we keep on moving through some of the other um, presenters and content, and we will come back at the end maybe with some um, uh, with some further uh, some further questions. Um, so um, next up, we have three short um, um, presentations, uh, and so I'll introduce each each speaker uh, um, separately. Um, and first up, I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Jim Iota. Uh, Jim uh, is the uh, CEO of Yamaha Motor Ventures and Laboratory Silicon Valley. Um, he joined Yamaha Motor Company in 2017, and in May last year, he was appointed in that role of CEO of Yamaha Motor Ventures, uh, and a company of, obviously that uh, decided to invest in Robotics Plus, one of the leading global ag tech companies, and and uh, a company that's well known to many people here in in New Zealand. So let's hear from Jim about the strategy of um, his company, Jim. Yeah, good morning or good afternoon for everyone. Uh, I'm happy to talk here about our activities and what we are looking for the agricultural opportunities. So let me share one slide. Uh, let me go through that one. Go. And, uh, here we go. Uh, can you, I don't know where I can see that one. Let me see. Okay, let's go to the first page and uh, can you see my slide well? All right. Okay, so let's start yep. to, all right, all right. So let's start to talk about my side. Um, Yamaha Motor is uh, probably, everybody knows my companies as a motorcycle companies, or maybe some people knows about the Yamaha Motors as a marine application like outboard engines. So we originally making some internal combustion engines and uh, forwarding that uh, project to the different applications. So we have in the New Zealand, you can see my like ATV or ROV for the agricultural purposes. So I think that we are happy to support the industry in the New Zealand from that space. But basically we are like excitement and making some product for the fun. So that's the space we have working for. So uh, back in 2015, we feels like we have to figure out something new, or maybe we have to say we have to attacking into the some opportunity in the future. So that's where we started this journeys. So we started back, we created the Yamaha Motor Ventures back in 2015, and uh, starting one man person's office and uh, just generating the what's going on in the Silicon Valley, the space we haven't known in the past. Then uh, we feel like now we have investment patience, so which is we are trying to change the world in a better way. So the basic concept is we have three pillars. One is the main pillar for us is the mobility and the aviation. Uh, I can talk about a little bit later. And also we are looking for the health and the wellness tech, which is going to be uh, our long-term vision, which is art for human possibilities. So we are trying to seek some human possibilities way. And the final box is uh, food and agriculture. So I will talk about this box today. But as I said, we have started one person's office and now we're creating the 11 persons. So we are trying to figure out what we can do in the world. And uh, I myself is uh, Jim out of the Yamaha Motor Ventures CEO. And also I'm in charge of the running the fund under the Yamaha Motor Ventures. 
And also I will be in charge of the margin and the acquisition strategy for the Yamaha Motors. So I have a double hat for the Yamaha Motor Corporation and the Yamaha Motor Ventures. And I'm, I myself is in charge of the inorganic growth in, in these pages. So uh, looking at the agriculture, like a uh, previous presentation is talking about the Japan is a super aging society. So, and the food is very important for the Japanese people. So it feels like this is a nice mega trend space we are closely looking at in the futures. So that is the first thing we start looking at this space back in 2015. And uh, we feels like, I think the previous presentation by Fadil is great because it's a super aging society, super manual job, and uh, the people is Simon is questioning about why the big Japanese company is not attacking into the robotic space. The answer is so much fragmented in Japanese uh, market. So that's why we feel like overseas opportunity is going to be the best way to develop some solutions for the agricultural space. That's why we are looking for the outside of Japan. And second point is uh, when we are testing of our product as a manufacturing companies, you don't believe the, how many times we are, you know, kicking the kickstand out, kickstand in. Actually, we one product requires like a 2000 times kickstand back and forth for the testing. But if you're looking at the agricultural space, you just only one time a year. That's a testing period you can do this. So that's why we're looking for the double hemispheres. I got to do something in the nose, something in the south. In that case, you can second time test at least compared with one time test. So I just focus on to the both hemisphere and we focus on to the horticulture because that's the space probably the automation is comes in play. So John Deere, big player focused on to the low crop and that is actually very automated. In Japan, life field, is pretty much automated. But horticulture side, or maybe fruits and veggie, very difficult to make automation. And our automation technology is inside of the building. So we have to go to the outside of the building because we have a mobility. So that's where we are starting with the journey of this. So at this moment is we have several company we invested in. And today's topic is Robotics Plus. Uh, Steve Saunders uh, journeys, we, we participated in these journeys. So we will try to help for the automation of the getting some solutions to be better world. And another company in the New Zealand in the center of the box is Invert Robotics, focused on to the daily tank first for the inspection machine. And they are trying to get into the more chemical space. So that's why uh, they are focused on to the different space. But basically we, our focus is ag, and ag tech and uh, what we are, what's gonna be a, we can use our capability or our expertise in the futures. At this moment is, we do not know much about the agricultural development, but we will try to learn what we can do in this space. So let me go to the next page. So they, I, I don't need to talk about the Steve's job, but we will try to help for the apple packers which is going to be, especially for the COVID-19 situation, we are trying to reduce over the human touch over the selection or sorting for the operation. So we will try to automation blinging into the inside of the pack house. That's one solution we can say. And uh, as I said, we have some automation in a Japanese domestic market, which is splaining over the life field by our unmanned choppers. So this is an open space and as, uh, as a Japan is very hilly. So some location we cannot use these solutions. So the, together with Robotics Plus, we are talking about the UVV project, which is splitting action from the ground side. So in that case, we can cover the better field and the best part is nighttime operation. So in a daytime, we need to see the aviation type of product in the air. You have to see with your eyes. But in the ground side of solution, that means you just only have a 12 hours a day. But in the nighttime, if you can work without any visual sensing, so in that case, you have a 24 hours a day. So that's the space. Maybe we can work together with Robotics Plus to optimize what's the space we have. 
And uh, so that maybe I've got to stop and another solution that we can talk about the logo skating, uh, but this is a robotics plus uh, project. It's skating itself is a very manual operation. So how we can eliminate the human touch and the human space. That's uh, things that they are working on. So all over the project is solving something. So that's my presentation. I gotta stop here. Thank you very much. Coming back to the Blender. Thank you, Blender. Thank you, Aota san Excellent presentation. You covered a, a lot of really interesting topics. The the log measurement uh, um, application that you did, that some of us are familiar with that in New Zealand, has that seen application in Japan? No much because we are not exporting countries. So okay. it, basically we are importing countries. But interestingly, the scaling itself is a Japanese standard, which is using for the New Zealand or any other locations. But basically, we are importing. We are not importing much. Uh, we are not exporting much of the okay. log scaling. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And and thank you for some great descriptions around again why there might be opportunities for New Zealand businesses to to look at partnerships in Japan, like you've described that that ability for some faster development cycles and the introduction of of specific specific skills. Uh, uh, is there anything in particular that you look at in terms of from, a, from an investability point of view when you're looking at organizations that you'd like to invest, invest in? What are, what are the main things you, you, that ring true for you? At this moment is we have a wider coverage, but basically we focus on the Hoti culture at this moment because it's a low crop side, we do not have a much advantage. So we wanted to solve like uh, uh, Payaz is saying the Japanese customer is just only having a two hectares. So it's a very fragmented. So the, but from the big company's point of view, the Hoti culture is very fragmented market. So that's the space we believe we can win in patterns in there. So I think that's the company who are trying to be in the Hoti culture commitment. That's the space we are looking for. That's great news for us. It's a space yep. that we're also looking at very strongly here in New Zealand, as you know, of course. And so yeah. great, great to hear there's more potential there. Um, um, I, I'm hoping that we get more, more time with you, Ayurasan, at the, at the end of today's presentation, but I will keep moving through the presenters now to keep us um, on schedule. And I do encourage people to keep on both putting questions into the Q&A and also to vote for the questions that you'd really like answered, because that will prioritize them when we get there uh, towards the end. Um, for our next uh, speaker, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Mr. Makoro Tinjo. Uh, Makoro San has been involved in the New Zealand meat industry for the last 20 years as part of, of ANSCO. And so many of our New Zealand uh, uh, participants here today will be very familiar with uh, ANSCO products and livestock products uh, and know that Japan has been a, a successful market for that business. Uh, and I suspect that Kinjo San is a large part of that success. So he's been involved not only in the sales perspective in Japan, but also from a producer's perspective of New Zealand's agricultural base, uh, which he recognizes as one of the most competitive in the world. Uh, Makara-san has, Makara has retired as the president of ANSCO and is now managing the, uh, the company uh, Ambrosia um, and is managing the Wakanui restaurant and developing new food products using New Zealand's agricultural base. So obviously a, a champion for what New Zealand has to produce. Uh, so Kinjo san would love to hear from you, please. And the, the tagline of 2020, you're on mute. Mute, okay. Okay, good morning and good afternoon. Turn it off, we'll go to turn this mute off. Okay, um, having coming from, from the background, um, meat industry background, um, and uh, having been involved involved in uh, um, uh, Hokkaido sheep farming uh, the projects, um, <clears throat> my perspective will be uh, that on uh, pasture-based farming and uh, uh, livestock management. And let me share the notes. I'm sharing that. Am I sharing the, yep. yep. Okay, um, the, the commercial opportunities for uh, the New Zealand um, agri-tech, um, the, from the, the uh, meat and um, the uh, pasture-based farming perspective, 
there is a, a growing interest in grass-fed farming in Japan, um, as we speak, and um, these these are driven by the reasons of uh, sustainability, animal welfare. Um, but uh, we hear a lot of um, the uh, the needs coming from uh, how to better utilize the idle um, the farmland um, in various parts of the country, and um, the. These are not just individual farmers, but also uh, corporate farmers and um, local governments um, that are looking to revitalize a, a local economy or, or trying to find the ways of uh, utilizing the, uh, the farmlands that they either they own or just sitting there in a community um, as an idol. Um, while there is that um, um, interest um, in that particular area, um, there are uh, the gross lack of expertise in this field. Um, and uh, uh, there's a little uh, government funding available in the research or, or, or uh, in the running of uh, the projects. Um, even the um, academic institutions um, are not uh, focusing in this area. Um, I hear so many um, uh, the people that the researcher from um, uh, researchers from uh, university referring to um, um, uh, the, the pasture or um, uh, uh, the grass as a roughage because that's the, how they see it. They don't see that as a um, the source of uh, uh, nutritious nutritional um, uh, feed for animals. Now, the, the Hokkaido Dairy Project, um, uh, driven by the uh, Fonterra and the Hokkaido Sheep Project, um, that's um, Ansco Foods, Hokkaido government, and Farm Age um, uh, together um, um, started, has really, has in a way, uh, initiated this. Uh, the, uh, the bridging of uh, uh, the technical cooperation between New Zealand and uh, uh, Hokkaido farmers. Um, they're utilizing the New Zealand expertise and the funding from uh, those companies. So um, while, while there's a need and there's a, uh, the market for it, and we went on and trialed it, and we are seeing uh, uh, fruits from uh, these uh, uh, challenges. Now, there are the two parts to this. Um, um, one is a, a soil and a pasture management. Um, and in that, uh, there are um, uh, areas such as the selection of a, a forage cultivar that's a suitable for, for Japanese market and Japanese soil and various parts of, um, of the country and for the purpose of the feeding animals um, rather uh, as a, uh, the uh, high quality feed not as a roughage. Um, and then also in management of, of uh, uh, soil or, and uh, uh, the pasture, things like uh, uh, sensoring, uh, remote sensoring technology um, to measure the moisture content in the soil and so on. Um, the soil nutrient uh, measurement, um, soil mapping um, and uh, irrigation systems, these are maybe a very a common uh, technology that, is, uh, that has been uh, prevailing um, in, um, in New Zealand and readily available and farmers are utilizing all the time, but that there, there is this big gap in that um, in, uh, in the Japanese agricultural scene. Um, In terms of livestock management, um, the, 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 the managing uh, animals on pasture, um, on grass, um, and, um, and that to uh, the maximize the utilization of land and uh, the pasture is available, um, it's something that not many farmers has practiced unless they were uh, put under those dairy project or sheep uh, uh, project and uh, been through the um, uh, the practice of maximizing the, uh, the feed um, 
uh, availability um, from the land. Um, there are um, the, the, our experience um, with uh, the Japanese uh, farmers uh, is that uh, practice such as um, uh, body conditioning scoring um, was not there. Um, and um, the understanding of the, the needs of animals, whether they need water, whether they need more feed, they need a certain uh, nutrients, or um, they're, uh, uh, they're uncomfortable with the wet ground. That's sort of the basic um, animals, uh, husbandry uh, themselves, uh, uh, something that the Japanese farmers who want to go on a, on a pasture based farming need to know. Um, and the monitoring of um, animal status um, uh, in terms of live weight scales, uh, disease de detections, and so on. Uh, there are a lot of technology technology that are already available in New Zealand that can be applied um, into the Japanese uh, situation. Um, parasite management, um, again, particularly with the, um, the sheep, um, which is uh, it's not uh, uh, commonly uh, produced in Japan, um, there's a, um, the, the lack of the knowledge of how to manage it, the lack of um, the, the uh, institutional support in research into the area or uh, making uh, tools and um, um, the trenches made available um, to, uh, to combat that problem. This is just one example. I think there are uh, 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 a whole array of um, um, the uh, animal uh, health and animal uh, husbandry management um, uh, issues that are not uh, properly uh, dealt with. And once they come to um, 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 running a commercial scale operation, then things like our own farm uh, quality assurance system, which is uh, uh, well established here and uh, improving uh, all the time, um, that can, again, will help commercialize the uh, pasture-based farming. Um, uh, of, of livestock, whether it's a cattle, whether it's a uh, sheep, or whether it's, it's a dairy cattle or beef cattle um, in Japan. And here are some of the, um, the, uh, uh, the results of our, our sheep projects. Uh, the, um, this is a Matsu farm in Hokkaido, um, very small scale farm. And, Alan McDermott, who's I'm here, you're in there somewhere uh, listening to this, um, help the uh, uh, Japanese sheep farmers um, to, um, to to gain the knowledge of the basic knowledge of animal husbandry, pasture management, um, and um, uh, the livestock uh, uh, health matters. As a result, this farm has seen significant improvement in uh, um, the uh, improved the health of sh uh, sheep, weight gain, um, uh, fertility, um, the uh, birth rate, the lambing rate, uh, and also a significant reduction in uh, uh, the uh, 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 death rate, so the, the survivals. So even with the two years, very small scale um, support from New Zealand, Farms like this um, have seen a, a significant improvement in the, um, the, uh, the farm management. As a result, they have seen increase in, uh, in income and a reduction in expense. So this is just one example, but uh, um, this can be taken to much larger scale in Japan because there is a land, there is a need, and there is a, um, there's a significant the lack of the knowledge and technology in this field. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kenjo san um, Excellent, uh, excellent piece of information and many things uh, in terms of um, application and livestock management that will be familiar to people here. Um, first of all, of course, I'd, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that even though you've retired as president of uh, of, of Ansco Foods, you are still obviously a director uh, at Ansco, so still very actively involved, which we're which we're grateful for. And as somebody who's done so much work uh, between New Zealand and Japan. One question I'd love to ask is, is how do you find New Zealand business culture with respect to Japanese business culture? Do, do we work well together 
uh, or maybe what's what's the one thing that, that businesses should be aware of when they're beginning to do business in Japan? Okay. Um, the, the, the wild news. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, while New Zealand companies work, um, uh, the, the regarded and treated Japanese market with uh, significant, significant importance, um, they were uh, willing to um, accommodate the needs and um, um, uh, the, say, the trends of Japan and to try to meet, uh, to work closely with the, uh, with the market. I have seen the, the change in the trend and the change in probably not just a, a company, but the meat industry as a whole, um, or um, uh, other agriculture related industry to uh, to be to be driven more towards the commodity trading to become more efficient, um, more productive, um, and more profitable uh, commodity uh, trading um, uh, entities. Now. Um, that has taken the, um, the eyes off the, the great opportunities that sit in Japan um, and, um, um, the, the, and the, the whole industry seemed to be driven by the, the meat and the, the short term, the immediate benefit that is available outside. Um, and I feel mm -hmm. um, a little disappointed that uh, the New Zealand uh, uh, industry, New Zealand business as a whole, have taken eyes off the uh, Japanese market. So an, op an opportunity to address. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kinjo-san. We'll have some final questions, but I do want to make sure that we uh, uh, move on to our next uh, speaker. Speaker. So um, Dr. Uh, Takayua Saito, uh, is, a re is a researcher at the Business Academia Cooperation Office of the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries of Japan. And his role uh, in this ministry is to promote government-led open innovation program named Field for Knowledge, Integration and Innovation. Uh, and so we're about to hear from that from a video, I believe. Uh, and this is a request for some international collaboration. So uh, thank you, Dr. Takeyu Saito. Let's uh, watch the video. Uh, thank you very much for providing me this great opportunity to introduce our open innovation program uh, named Field for Knowledge, Integration and Innovation. Uh, we call this FKIA, FKROI. Our government uh, ministry uh, installed this activity back to 2016 to activate agriculture, forestry, fisheries and food industries by involving uh, various industries uh, such as life science, physics, chemistry, social science, or computers. Uh, we understand they are not directly related to uh, ag agriculture or food industries. However, they have so many technologies or experiences which can be utilized for agriculture food industries. So that we started FKII back to 2016 by involving many industries. So I wanted to explain the structure of FKIA. Uh, there are three layers under FKIA. The basement, the layers is the Council of Industry, Academia, Government Collaboration. Uh, this is kind of the places where a member can join as a members and have a discussion for future possible collaborations. So for instance, the member from agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and food industries can join as a members to the council at the same time as the various industries such as computers, engineering can join as a members as well so that they can meet new collaborators, new companies, new researchers, new scientists so that they can exchange some you know, ideas for future possible collaborations. Once they find the possible collaborators, they can have the research group, which is, is the second layers. Uh, we call this research project group as our R&D platform. 
So again, R&D platform is kind of the research group consists of the members from the council. Then uh, within R&D platform, they can discuss specific research project, then conduct the project itself. So project is kind of the top layers. Uh, we call this research consortium. As of today, uh, we have more than 3,500 members, mainly from agriculture, food industries, IT services, or other private companies, and also uh, universities, scientists, government research institutions as a member, they are members. So again, uh, there are so many members from many industries. Uh, this is my proposal to New Zealand the collaboration between Japan and New Zealand under FKII. Uh, from Japan, FKII, uh, we have so many technologies that can be utilized to New Zealand. Also, uh, we are expecting to understand some challenges New Zealand is now facing so that we can improve our technologies to fit the New Zealand conditions. Also, uh, we are expecting scientific input or technologies from New Zealand to Japan so that we can modify our technology together under the collaboration between Japan and New Zealand. So that uh, I have two proposals to New Zealand today. Uh, number one is the New Zealand to join FKII and also as existing, they join existing r and platform under FKII so that they can have some discussion with Japanese company, universities, or scientists. And second option is that New Zealand to establish new r and platform, new research group under FKII so that New Zealand can invite many universities, companies, scientists, so that they can have a unique, interesting topic for future collaborations. This is my proposal and this is my uh, end of my presentation today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, um, Seido-san. So a, a call to action from collaboration. I feel like with just one hour, we're beginning to sort of just scrape the surface of a lot of different topics. And I'm aware that we have five minutes left. So. Um, I think today will be the start of some further discussions around opportunities to collaborate. Um, and um, um, and I, I, I know that we'll be following up with NZTE um, um, to enable that. And one of the ways to enable that is with a virtual business tour that I know Yoshifumi uh, will be able to tell us about. So Yoshifumi, could I introduce you to tell us about the virtual business tour where maybe some of the questions that are being raised here could find uh, another forum for being, for being answered. Uh, thank you very much, Brendan. Uh, Yoshihumi again. Uh, I think we had we have got a uh, very uh, good insights today from the speakers, I believe. And I was particularly interested in the proposal that was given by uh, Dr. Saro in the end uh, from Jap uh, Japanese government. And uh, I understand his intention is for New Zealand to form a platform for mainly researchers and academics. But from the perspective of NZT in Tokyo, uh, I think we can respond to his proposal from business perspective. And I'm very pleased to announce the launch of this platform. And uh, our NZT, uh, this platform is for virtual business mission and B2B uh, matchmaking. And this is free to all Agritech New Zealand members and NZT customers and everybody in New Zealand uh, who involved in agri-tech business. And this is a kind of a social network site limited to target audience in Japan and New Zealand, agri-tech uh, people. The platform is a closed social network for people in Japan who are interested in New Zealand agri-tech and New Zealand agri-tech community. And targeted Japanese participants in, talk, uh, in Japan are uh, uh, invited to focus on three segments like this. Uh, one is uh, trading companies like Mitsubishi, Mitsui, Sumitomo, and also Japanese uh, uh, partners, Japanese conglomerates 
like Yamaha, uh, Yamaha Kubota, and also our younger farmers who, are, who doesn't have allergy, much of allergy to speaking English. So uh, the platform will, will also offer a series of features as virtual meetings, online ex uh, exhibitions, as well as uh, webinars. And only the target group will be able to participate in this platform. And the platform is like this. And currently this site is on demo like this, but this is going to be in live, live uh, in the middle of May. And this is how we can use for the registra registration and business, business mat matching and a uh, few steps like this, uh, easy registration uh, starting from mid-May. And you can create uh, your profile uh, with personal, a personal, a personal and company and product information uh, in this site. And uh, this can be browse a uh, participant marketplace to find potential business partners. And you can be found by others. And messaging and arranging the video call meetings can be done in this uh, one platform. And again, this is go going to be live in May. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you at this space. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Yoshi Fumi. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious um, of time, so I see some of the presenters are answering questions, open questions uh, uh, in the Q and A function there, which is, which is great. Uh, we need to, we need to finish up, um, and so I'd just like to thank you, thank all of the participants who came today, all of the presenters. Um, for such insightful uh, information. I think it's going to prompt further questions and discussion. And I know that the NZT team and ourselves at Agritech NZ are going to be happy to try and help facilitate that going forward. There's no doubt that the virtual business trip um, is um, um, a great way to look at uh, answering some of those, um, uh, answering some more of those questions. Uh, if I was to sort of summarize back, um, obviously we've heard of some significant challenges um, but the opportunities that match with those challenges, um, that localization um, is obviously key, which speaks of real collaboration and um, real relationships built with, with local players. And I guess that's what, what's represented really strongly here in terms of the potential for investment and partnership. Um, I guess we're also talking about uh, niche opportunities and niche opportunities in, th in areas like horticulture, which are two areas of strength for New Zealand, both being able to uh, um, um, develop significant applications in niche areas uh, and a developing strength around horticulture as well as our uh, traditional grass-fed um, solutions as, as um, represented by uh, Kinjo-san. So I'd like to thank anybody, everybody for coming along today and participating. I'd like to thank uh, Yoshifimo in particular from NZTE for helping pull together today's uh, section. Um, we will look at following up on, on some of the material and the research report that was presented um, early on will be available for, for participants as well. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to thank uh, Vicky, Caro and Kerry and the team for helping run the event. So thank you very much. Um, goodbye. Thank you.